one of the benefits of coming out to meditate in a place like this is it allows you to step back, give yourself some space, give yourself some time to think about your life. This is especially true at times like this in the holidays. At the beginning of the year, you realize it's another year. They're not going to put 2014 on your tombstone. Now, 2015 is another matter. You don't know how much time you have. The more time you do have, you want to make the best of it. So what does it mean to make the best of your time? That's something each of us has to decide. Now, there are a lot of currents in society that would like to decide those questions for you. But if you want to decide the questions for yourself, you have to step outside a bit. Go sit under a tree. Sit in an empty dwelling. Some place when you're totally cut off from contact with other people and see what you've got. See where you've come from, see where you're going. Meditation is not always just about being in the present moment. One of the few places where the Buddha really emphasizes being aware of the present moment is in a sutta where he goes on to say, once you are aware of what's going on, then you have to do your duty with regard to what's going on. So you're not just sitting there being with the present. You're being with the present with a sense of knowing that you're shaping it to some extent. You've shaped it through your past actions, and you're shaping it now with your present actions. And what's the best way to shape it? The Buddha's recommendation is that you focus on the issue of stress, dukkha, also translated as suffering, and particularly the kind that you're causing yourself. You would think that everything you would do would be, would be for the purpose of pleasure, and often it is, but all too often your actions lead to stress, lead to pain, lead to disappointment. The question is why? What can you do now? What can you do as you look at your life to see this issue more clearly, to figure out, okay, where is your ignorance? Because as the Buddha said, it's because of our ignorance that we act in ways that are causing us stress. The Buddha himself saw that to see these things you have to get away. From your normal concerns, from your normal responsibilities. Even if you can't get away all the time, you try to find some spaces of time where you can come out. Put all your connectors aside and try to connect with yourself. What's going on here? Where do you want this to go? One of the things you can't plan about is specifically what are the problems that are going to come up in the course of the year, but you can anticipate that whatever problems do come up are going to require some good qualities of mind, especially the unexpected ones. You're going to be needing to be mindful, alert, and have the energy to deal with these things. This is one of the reasons why meditation is good for just about everything, a good preparation for just about everything, because you develop qualities of mindfulness, alertness. Mindful, you're being mindful to remember to stay with the breath. That's what mindfulness means, is holding something in mind, and you're remembering that you want to stay here with the breath. And we do that consistently. That's an element of ardency. You have to be alert to see what's going on, to notice when you're sliding away from the breath or when you've totally jumped away from the breath, and figure out how to get back as quickly and as securely as possible. This means you have to watch over your meditation. This is where mindfulness practice slides into concentration practice. The Buddha never made a clear distinction between mindfulness and concentration. As mindfulness moves toward concentration, that element of mindfulness turns into directed thought. You remember to stay with one object that you're thinking about, and your alertness and ardency combine into another factor that the Buddha called evaluation. 
This is where the concentration also involves a certain amount of discernment. You evaluate the object of your meditation, in this case the breath, so the mind can be really snug with it, so it's not likely to want to wander off. And one of the meanings of evaluation is that you evaluate the breath as it's coming in, going out. How does it feel? Could you improve it? And can you improve it without messing it up? All too often our efforts to change things involve squeezing this or putting pressure on that. We're trying to develop a type of concentration where you can be with something and yet not tighten up around it. When I was first meditating with a John Fung, I would hear him say, you try to catch hold of the breath, and I'd try to tense up around the breath to catch it. And of course, you can't catch the breath that way. Then you just end up being tense. And one day I was sitting on a bus in Bangkok, and the thought occurred to me, well, why tense up around the breath? The breath is not something you tense up around. It's a flowing energy. Why don't you just allow it to come in and go out freely? openly. And I was able to stay with it and not get tense. So I went back and, being a Westerner, of course, I told him he was teaching people wrong to catch the breath. He laughed. He said, well, that's not what he meant by catch. For him, catch meant to follow, to stick to something, stick with the breath, allow it to have its freedom, he said. And so right here we're learning a new way to evaluate our relationship to the breath. If we see ourselves tensing up around it, we realize, okay, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be concentrated yet, have a st <clears throat> strong sense of being allowing and not putting too many boundaries around the breath. So the first thing to do is to evaluate how you're settling with the breath. How does the mind relate to the breath? And is the breath comfortable? How can you change the breath in a way that's going to make it more comfortable, more interesting to stay here, more pleasurable to stay here. And then finally you evaluate, once you've got a sense of pleasure, what are you going to do with it? And John Lee recommends that you allow it to spread throughout the body. Now this partly means simply allowing the sense of energy to spread as openly as possible. And if you see any parts of the body that are tight or feel blocked, what can you do to Loosen them up. You don't try to push the breath through them. You loosen them up, and once they're loosened up, the breath can go on its own. And then you begin to realize, as you get more and more sensitive to the breath, that there are other levels of breath energy as well that can flow through anything. Without those levels of energy, you wouldn't be able to feel the parts of the body you tensed up. So there are several layers of breath going on here. And as you evaluate the experience of being with the breath and noticing how the different energies in the body interrelate, you get more and more sensitive to all the layers of things going on in the body and the layers of things going on in your mind. This is why evaluation is the beginning of discernment. In the three causal factors of the first jhana, the Buddha describes, and John Lee pointed out that there are five <coughs> factors that the Buddha describes. But John Lee pointed out that there are three that are the causes. There's directed thought, evaluation, and then singleness of preoccupation. That's when your directed thought gets so steady that you're really just with the breath continually. And at the same time, the breath becomes an object that fills your sense of the body. As you breathe in, it feels like the breath is coming in and out through every pore. And all these breath channels are getting connected. Once you've got those going, you've got on the one hand you've got the elements of tranquility and the directed thought and the singleness of preoccupation, and you've got the elements of discernment and insight with the evaluation. Because what you're doing is evaluating the amount of disturbance, stress, dis-ease you may be feeling with the breath, and looking for the cause. Sometimes the causes are in the body, sometimes the causes are in the mind. That's what discernment does. It looks for the stress and looks for the causes, it tries to comprehend the stress. And once you see what causes are connected with the stress, you can abandon them. 
This is also why the Buddha has his focus on the issue of inconstancy, anicca. Sometimes that's translated as impermanence, but your direct experience of it is not, you know, is this going to be permanent or not? It's more, is this a constant sensation? And the level of stress, the level of pleasure in the body begin to realize are not constant. They go up and they go down. And the up and down have to do with how you're relating to the breath, how you're breathing. Lots of different factors that you can investigate right here, right now. When the level of stress goes up, what did you do? What happened with the breath? And what happened to your focus? When the level of stress goes down, what did you do? When you get look, used to looking for, for those issues, then you can start noticing the level of stress in the mind. And the same questions apply. When the level of stress in the mind goes up, what did you do? When it goes down, what did you do? Try to see these connections. So this is how mindfulness blends into concentration. Concentration blends into the practices of discernment. They're all part of a single path. This is an important point to remember. Because sometimes, if, especially if you hear mindfulness being defined as just being receptive to whatever comes up and not being judgmental, and then you look at the other factors of the path and it doesn't fit in. Right view is about stress and its causes and comprehending the stress so you can abandon the cause and you develop the path. These are things you have to actively do. You have to pass judgment on something. Is this stress? Is this not stress? Which is the cause? Which is the effect? Based on right view, you develop right resolve. You want to act in ways, think in ways that are going to alleviate stress. And then you practice right speech, right action, right livelihood, so as to eliminate the causes of stress that you're creating in your life. And make sure that the way you conduct your life is not burdening other people unnecessarily. And there's right effort where you're trying to abandon what's unskillful, trying to develop what's skillful. Right concentration, you're trying to get the mind to settle down and be really, really still. All of these things are active. There's an abandoning and there's a developing. Now, if mindfulness were simply accepting whatever's there, it wouldn't fit in with the rest of the path. But the Buddha never defines mindfulness as accepting whatever is there. Mindfulness is keeping something in mind. And that's combined with alertness and ardency in his sutta on the establishing of mindfulness. Everyone seems to assume that that sutta is a comprehensive treatment of what mindfulness practice is. But when you look at the questions at the beginning of the sutta, the Buddha sets out the formula for mindfulness and then asks questions only about one part. What does it mean to keep track of something? Keep track of the body in and of itself. Keep track of the feelings in and of themselves, mind, mental qualities. And the rest of the formula, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with the reference to the world, doesn't get explained at all. Some people reading the sutta think, well, there's nothing said about what to do with mind states as they come or feelings as they come and go. So the Buddha must not want you to do anything. But when you realize the sutta is part of a larger context, where there are other suttas where the Buddha talks about what does it mean to be mindful about pleasant feelings? What does it mean to be alert about pleasant feelings? Painful feelings. Different kinds of pleasant and painful feelings. He says there are some that should be encouraged and some that shouldn't be encouraged, both the pleasures and the pains. Even more clearly with different mind states. Some mind states are skillful, some are not. If it's an unskillful mind state, you want to do whatever you can. Now, sometimes that does mean just watching it for a while to figure it out. In the same way, back in the 1950s, people studied Russian so they could figure out the, the, the communists. In other words, you study it and you learn about it, not just so you accept it as it is, but you want to do something about it. When you realize that, then you see how mindfulness blends immediately and the concept builds on right effort and blends immediately into right concentration. So it all comes together. These are things that you can learn 
if you give yourself some space, give yourself some time, and get your priorities straight. What are your priorities in life? What do you want out of life? There's a New Yorker cartoon that showed people walking around with sticks coming up their backs with a little string hanging down from the end of the stick, and there was a carrot dangling right in front of everybody's noses as they were trudging along the street. And then there was a sports carrot, a guy with a sports carrot driving by on the street. He had the carrot, and everybody else was working for the sake of that carrot. Are those the carrots you want? Is that what you want out of life? A sports carrot? Would you like to figure out this problem? Why are you causing unnecessary stress, both for yourself and for others? What can you do about it? Give your mind some space and time to think this over.